I'm delighted um, <clears throat> to, to share uh, uh, work from my lab with you today on um, sort of sex chromosome evolution in moths and butterflies. Uh, and I've got two, two goals here. One is to talk about the research here and sort of give you a broad overview of, of some of the things that we're working on, and also to promote some of the presentations from the four other members from my lab group who are here um, who have contributed substantially to this. So I'm um, just giving some motivation for their work. Um, <clears throat> but to begin with, um, uh, sex chromosomes are sort of like catnip to a certain group of evolutionary biologists. Many of us here consider ourselves this. And it's because we, there are many important differences between the sex chromosomes, in particular the Z or X chromosome, and the autosomes, right? So we've got all sorts of different things like um, copy number, the residence time in male versus female. A bunch of diff these different things are going on uh, between sex chromosomes and autosomes. And as a result, evolution is going to play out differently between the Z chromosome or the sex X chromosome and the autosomes. And so in that comparison between the sex chromosome and the autosome, there's a, um, a lot of space for learning about evolutionary processes. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons that I think we all are so drawn to this contrast between uh, C chromosomes, or sex chromosomes and autosomes. Now, most of this work um, has been done primarily in male heterogametic taxa. Uh, and I'm not going to explain the differences here because we've heard this enough times uh, today. But uh, the point is that the major model systems that we're working with are going to be uh, male heterogametic. Uh, these guys lack a Y chromosome, they're XO, but still male heterogametic in this case. Um, and uh, this pr potentially presents a bias that we have to sort of recognize. And that bias comes in when you start to consider sex-specific selection. So let me just give you a very simple cartoon example of sex-specific selection, uh, which is that um, if we're going to talk about butterflies, let's talk about butterflies. These are monarch butterflies. The males and females look a little bit different. Now, um, most selective pressures are going to be shared between uh, members of the same species, right? So they want to avoid getting eaten, right? So some orioles do eat monarch butterflies, okay? But which, um, when you start to think about particularly reproductive processes, uh, females are the ones that need to lay eggs and they need to find the host plant to lay their eggs, right? So females need to find uh, milkweed uh, and, and they're gonna have much stronger selection on them than males. Uh, males don't have to lay eggs, they're not worried about milkweed, but males have to find the females, right? So there's gonna be strong selection in this case for males to be able to locate females, right? So this is just a cartoon example to demonstrate sex-specific selection. but. Uh, what happens is that uh, if you're only studying sort of uh, heterogamity uh, or sex chromosomes in male heterogametic taxa, you're potentially confounding male-specific selection with uh, heterogamity. And so what we want to be able to do is sort of test the, a lot of these hypotheses associated with heterogamity and sex chromosomes in female heterogametic taxa, right? Uh, in, in taxa that have what we call Z and W chromosomes. So remember, Z is the intact chromosome. The W is that degenerate uh, chromosome analogous to the Y. So what are these taxa? We've had a couple of examples today. My apologies to the botanist. I'm just going to ignore plants. <laughs> um, but um, the important point is that with these things, we can reverse the relationship between sex-specific selection and heterogamity. And so there are a lot of nice examples that are relatively undescribed still in uh, fish and in squamates. There's uh, also some, some uh, parasites that have uh, ZW sex determination. Um, and, and there's, I think, a lot of potential to learn from these. Uh, but most prominent are uh, birds uh, have uh, are female heterogamic and also Lepidoptera, moths and butterflies. Uh, and so I happen to focus on moths and butterflies, although there's a lot of parallel work done in birds, and some interesting contrast between them as well. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about today is just to give you a, a sort of a glimpse of what we've learned about dosage compensation, um, in particular what we can learn from neosex chromosomes and the presence of neosex chromosomes in uh, moths and butterflies, uh, patterns of sex-biased expression uh, in these guys, and then I'm actually going to move right away from sex chromosomes at the very end and talk about weird sperm biology. So still genomics of sex, but not sex chromosomes. Uh, so that'll be my, um, my, my um, encore, as it were, maybe. Um, but uh, thankfully, Melissa's given us a really nice introduction to sex chromosome evolution and the idea of dosage compensation. Uh, dosage compensation uh, presents a real problem for sex chromosomes, or rather the gene dosage problem, because uh, in this case, in males, the uh, Z chromosome is going to be diploid. It's going to sort of retain that ancestral level of expression. When you have interactions between proteins from the autosomes and proteins from the Z chromosome, the stoichiometric balance is going to be okay. Uh, there's not a dosage effect. You're not going to disrupt things. 
But females in this case potentially have a problem. They've got half the gene dose and therefore perhaps half the gene product. And so you're going to have these uh, dr uh, disrupted balance between the Z chromosomes and the autosomes. We know this is probably bad. And so this is why um, evolutionary theory generally predicts there to be uh, X uh, specific upregulation of that single Z chromosome in this case. Uh, and of course, this uh, theory applies perfectly well in XY systems, and we know, at least in Drosophila, that this is, seems to be what happens. The male X chromosome is substantially upregulated. It may very well be what had happened to mammals. It's a, a little bit more of a nuanced, difficult story, but there's a clear prediction here that, that there should be upregulation of that single, single Z, uh, X chromosome in the heterogametic sex, or the single Z chromosome. So how do we actually go about sort of assessing this? Um, uh, one, one sort of broad way of doing this is to compare the Z average expression on the Z chromosomes to the average expression on the autosomes. And if dosage compensation has been complete, then you expect that that Z chromosome is going to be expressed at, the back at about the same level as the autosomes. Um, if it's incomplete, then that Z chromosome should be substantially reduced relative to autosomes. But in these analyses, you also have to uh, make sure that you look at the males as well, because uh, the prediction is that that Z chromosome is going to be equal to the autosomes in, in males as well. So this is one approach to assessing dosage compensation. You're comparing the absolute values of the autosomes to the sex chromosome. And the assumption is that the autosomes somehow represent that sort of ancestral level of the, of the sex chromosomes. The other approach is to contrast the male to female expression ratio on the autosomes and on the Z chromosomes. Uh, when there's complete dosage compensation, then those should be relatively balanced. Uh, if there's incomplete um, compensation, then you're going to have dosage effects where the male, uh, the Z chromosome is going to be distinctly male biased relative to the autosomes. So these are the sort of two ways we have for looking at this, at least grossly. Uh, and when uh, people first did these sorts of analyses, the patterns in the major XY uh, model systems were uh, consistent with complete dosage compensation. Well, that's nice. It all lines up with theory quite well. Uh, but then work expanded into uh, female heterogametic taxa, and we got a completely different story. Uh, it looked like over and over again we were seeing the absence of uh, complete dosage compensation. There was a strong dosage effect on the Z chromosome. Uh, the Z chromosome was reduced in females relative to autosomes. So that now brings us to Lepidoptera. This is where I uh, started working on this problem, was that sort of at this point. Uh, we have a clear expectation from the precedent, at least, that male uh, lepidopters should have uh, a strong dosage effect and that Z chromosome reduced relative to autosomes. The first opportunity to do this was in um, uh, silkworm. There's a large microarray data, and so we analyzed the male to female expression uh, differences on the Z chromosome and the autosome, and they actually overlapped substantially. So there seemed to be balanced male to female expression on the Z chromosome. That suggests something like complete dosage compensation is going on here. Uh, it became a little bit more surprising than uh, when we compared the Z chromosome relative to the autosomes and found that the Z was reduced relative to the autosomes. And this was in both males and females, and this was across multiple tissues. Um, and <clears throat> we've since gone on and to, to replicate this. Both myself and other researchers I wasn't involved with have, have shown uh, that the Z chromosome, in this case in Heliconius butterflies, is substantially reduced relative to basically all the other autosomes. So this is just showing that you can, you can replicate this. And so we end up with this pattern that is a bit hard to reconcile both with theory and also precedent from other ZW taxa, that the Z chromosome is reduced relative to autosomes, both in males and in females, whereas in other heterogametic taxa, you see a pattern that looks much more like this, where there's a dosage effect uh, and the W chromosome, sorry, the Z chromosome is reduced. Um, so why is this? What's going on? That's uh, a lot more work to come. Um, but I will say that, uh, in brief, I think what's happening is that the males are actively downregulating that Z chromosome in some way. Um, and why they're doing this, uh, how they're doing that, I'm not really sure. Um, but uh, one approach we have for looking at this is to work in systems that have neo-Z chromosomes. And in this case, what we have, uh, this lineage in particular, City of Pominella, this is the apple coddling moth, literally the worm in your apple. Uh, and um, there was um, a Z to autosome, or a Z to autosome or fusion where an autosome was translocated and, and uh, linked to the Z chromosomes, giving us uh, an ancestral Z segment and a neo Z segment here. Um, and I need to um, just point out Peter, uh, who's here, who initially sort of characterized this system. And so uh, this is useful, uh, as another postdoc in my lab, Aloy, uh, recognized, because what you can do is use these uh, neo-Z genes here 
uh, and compare them in expression to the autosomal orthologs in another species to look at what the pattern of uh, gene expression is. Now, I'm not going to steal his thunder. He's going to present on this a little bit later, but I will say that it is consistent with the idea that males are actively downregulating their Z chromosome. Uh, but please talk to a lawyer or listen to his talk if you want to get more details about that. But these neo Z chromosomes uh, are not limited to just this one lineage. Um, we've also discovered a neo Z chromosome, a different neo Z chromosome, uh, in monarch butterfly. Uh, and you can see, uh, I hope, a little bit. This is a W chromosome, which we think is a neo W chromosome. This is the partner of the Z. And these blue blobs are distinctly bigger than all the other blue blobs, uh, suggesting that they really are sort of a fusion. They're quite large. Um, uh, Andrew's analysis of this was primarily bioinformatic, and we have these pretty pictures here. Thank, uh, thanks to uh, Anna uh, and Peter, Anna has another poster over there on yet another uh, Neo-Z chromosome uh, system in Lepidoptera. Peter has described several more, more of these cytogenetically, and so we have several uh, opportunities to contrast um, autosome linkage with uh, sex linkage of different sets of genes across the Lepidoptera. And so this is a relatively new recognition of, of this pattern in Lepidoptera, and I'm, I'm quite excited to pursue it um, with the help from these other people here. Now, I want to return back to the idea of sex-specific selection for a minute, um, because sex-specific selection can give rise to this antagonistic or conflictual uh, patterns of selection between males and females. So if a trait that's expressed in one sex uh, has low fitness, but when expressed in another sex has higher fitness, you can end up with these <coughs> conflicting or antagonistic relationships. Um, and so, in short, what's good for the goose is bad for the gander, right? And so this can play out in different ways on the sex chromosomes versus the autosomes in terms of sex-biased gene expression. The outcome of sexual conflict, one predicted outcome, is sex-biased gene expression. And because the Z chromosome or the X chromosome sends, spends different time in male versus female, the sort of chromosomal distribution of these sex-biased genes is expected to be different on the autosomes versus the sex chromosomes. And because of that, we can, we can sort of test for whether there's a, a, an excess or, or a dearth of, of sex-biased genes. Uh, in male heterogametic taxa, what we observe and, and what is predicted, uh, at least under a certain set of parameters, is that the male biased genes are underrepresented on the, on the X chromosome. But remember, female heterogamity is going to reverse this relationship between sex-specific selection and heterogamity. And so it goes uh, in the end of the direction with the predictions under female heterogametic taxa. We expect hypermasculinization of the Z chromosome and that male bias genes should be actually enriched or overrepresented on the Z chromosome. And with the RNA-seq data that we have, again showing Heliconia sydna, we do in fact see this pattern. And so what you're looking at here are the uh, male bias genes in uh, blue, female bias genes in pink, uh, and then the unbiased genes in the middle for all of the um, chromosomes, and then sort of in aggregate here A, and this is the Z chromosome. And you can see there's about twice as much, uh, twice as many male bias genes uh, as you have uh, relative to the autosomes in general. And so again, we see, see this uh, prediction from sexual conflict theory holding up here, even in female heterogametic taxa. So to sort of put this all together then, um, the significance of, of this really is that I'm trying to convey is that work, working in female heterogametic taxa gives us the opportunity to tease apart sex-specific selection with heterogamity. Uh, in the context of dosage compensation, Lepidoptera in particular produce a somewhat disruptive result with regards to what's going on in, in our understanding of dosage compensation, although I think our understanding of dosage compensation is changing pretty much everywhere all the time right now. So um, I don't know exactly. Um, how to interpret this in terms of relative to theory, but the basic theory right now doesn't really line up with our predictions or the precedent from other ZW taxa. Patterns of sex biased expression on Z chromosomes versus autosomes does actually line up pretty well with our theory, so that's, that's uh, sort of a nice confirmatory result. Uh, and we have a lot more opportunity here to test these things with different uh, independently evolved neosex chromosomes. Now, as I promised you, I want to talk about sperm in the last couple minutes here. Um, sperm. Um, really do amazing things. They are remarkably diverse cell types. Uh, and this is just one example of a couple of different varieties of sperm um, uh, diversity. In Lepidoptera, there is uh, a particular type of sperm uh, um, uh, diversity called dimorphism, where so you have two distinct sperm types. One type, the eupyrene sperm, are essentially normal uh, in terms of the fact that they have a nucleus, they have DNA. 
Um, although they do get packaged into these bundles in males. So these are actually bundles of, of um, a large number of sperm together. In contrast, pretty much all Lepidoptera make apyrene sperm. They lack a nucleus. They do not have DNA. And this is really strange because what are sperm without DNA doing, right? And they're about 10 times more abundant as well. So all of this back here, these are the apyrene sperm, which are never bundled, um, at least not um, as mature products. So what are we doing with these? Um, our approach <coughs> is to use proteomics, so shotgun mass spectrometry, to try and characterize the, prote the proteome of these two different sperm types to make sense of them at the molecular level so that we can start to assess what the function of them is uh, and, and what selective pressures may be driving these apyrene sperm function or sperm evolution as well. And one of the first challenges we had was to be able to separate them uh, because, you know, they, they come together in a pool. This is pretty small stuff. But um, we did actually manage to uh, come up with a method, quite simple, actually. It's just sort of like panning for gold where you can um, uh, spin them in a, uh, in a Petri dish and they sort of, the apyrene sperm go to the outside, the eupyrene sperm concentrate into the center, and there you go. We've got rel relatively purified fractions here where we can um, apply proteomic analysis to the different types. Um, and uh, the first thing we did was just sort of look at them on a gel. And indeed, not surprisingly, they overlap substantially. But where they are different, uh, you get a lot more uh, proteins present in the eupyrene uh, sperm than you do in the apyrene sperm. But there are uh, apyrene-specific proteins that show up as well. And this pattern from the gels was replicated when we actually sort of threw mass spectrometry on it and were able to identify particular um, sets of genes. And indeed, it looks like the uh, apyrene sperm are uh, sort of a streamlined eupyrene sperm. Of course, we expect them to lack the genes that are associated with DNA and, and a nucleus. But um, uh, what we are also particularly interested in is what are these things? What are the genes that are present in the apyrene sperm? Because that's sort of the mystery. What are apyrene sperm doing and how they're evolving? Um, and um, this is a work in progress, so I don't have any particular results for you yet. We're still getting there. But um, we have this gene set now, and we can really start to say something um, evolutionarily about these with the appropriate analyses, population genetics, genomics, and, and um, functional information. Uh, and hopefully, at some point, uh, doing targeted knockdown with CRISPR to sort of get at this stuff. Um, but one last um, thing that I'm really excited about uh, in terms of trying to work on this, this thing, and it doesn't have anything to do with genomics, but um, Andrew has recently developed uh, successfully artificial insemination, at least in one species of moth. And so since we can separate apyrene from eupyrene sperm, there's really an excellent opportunity here to do sort of organismal experiments to manipulate the presence of apyrene sperm and sort of figure out what the function is, uh, both sort of in single matings but in multiple matings. Uh, and so um, thank you very much for uh, listening and, and um, hearing the story that I have to tell about our research, and please do engage the other folks in my lab. Um, they'll be happy to talk about uh, all of this with you as well.